Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September 2024 Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Before we get started, as always, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Industry Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support and making this meeting possible. Uh, we have some great speakers today. We'll go through the agenda, and I think this is going to be a great call. So there we go. As always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we trust each other, excuse me, we treat each other with respect never discriminate, communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. Um, everyone is welcome to our meetings, and this is intended to be an open forum for sharing ideas and having constructive discussions. If you have something to say, by all means, uh, speak up, put it in the chat. But the more interaction we have, I think the better it is for everyone. That we'd like to express our appreciation to the Hyperledger Premier members. Uh, their logos are shown on the screen and the general members. And if you haven't been involved in an open source project before, I mean, welcome. Uh, this is meant to be an open environment. As I mentioned, feel free to lurk. Don't wait for an invitation to speak. And uh, yeah, just go ahead and, and chime in uh, as you feel fit. Here's our agenda for today. We've already covered the introduction. We'll, we'll go over some Hyperledger community information. James will give us an update on blockchain in the mortgage industry. That's always one of our hard points. Then Nick Grant, uh, excuse me, Rick Grant, a noted author and speaker, will join us to discuss how AI and blockchain are being used in the real estate industry. Then we also have Jimmy Dorsey, uh, Oregon realtor, blockchain entrepreneur and broker and former gold rush actor. So we'll go, we'll let him go into that as he sees fit. And he's going to discuss his migrate app. I've taken a look at that app and it looks really interesting. Okay, we always cover this slide in each of our meetings, and this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey. We just may be at different paths along, and we just may be at different points along that path, excuse me. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases and define potential implementation paths for the mortgage industry. What does a mortgage company need or a real estate company need to implement blockchain? And how difficult is it to implement blockchain? Okay, the next several slides are for those that are new to the group and I'll burn through those pretty quickly. This slide provides links to different resources, so all the links are on the right-hand side. The only one that I want to call out and we'll speak to a little bit more is the second from the bottom. That's our Hyperledger Wiki, and that contains meeting notes for our groups, recordings from different sessions, curated articles, and James will speak to that uh, as well. These are great resources, so you're welcome to use all of those. How do you access them? You will need an LFID. Uh, that's a Linux Foundation ID, and this slide shows how to get the act, an LFID and a real easy video. Uh, if you uh, really want to get into Hyperledger and Hyperledger Fabric, you can get a Hyperledger Fabric certification. Um, those are, I, I think, very uh, beneficial for technologists. And then blockchain training. This is how I got up to date in blockchain and also Hyperledger Fabric. And one of my favorite words is it's free. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to James and the status of blockchain. Thank you, Marvin. Great introduction as always. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the first slide. <clears throat> so the, this first one's actually kind of big. It has an impact for our um, uh, overall partner that supports us, the Linux, Linux Foundation. So they have announced the intent to create a new umbrella organization called LF Decentralized Trust. The CEO of Tafir, Swapnil Bertia, 
interviews Daniela Barbosa, who is the general manager of blockchain and identity for the Linux Foundation. And she's also the current executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation to discuss the vision behind the trust in this 20 minute podcast. The trust is an expansion of the work Linux Foundation has been doing for almost a decade now as part of the Hyperledger Foundation. The decentralized trust projects focus will be to unify blockchains and digital identity projects and seeking to create opportunities for cloud providers, noting that governments want diversity in vendors. Barbosa discusses expansion of access to developers for decentralized technologies with potential for existing hyperledger communities to further expand into new ecosystems. Barbosa also discusses about expanding interest in blockchain and digital identity projects across industries and is looking to recruit new projects and communities for layer one blockchain contributions. We'll keep you posted on additional updates and future presentations um, as to if it has any impact for uh, the um, Hyperledger presentations that we do. So more information to be coming out on that as they continue to release updates. The next article, discusses the impact of blockchain tech and how, what it's having on the real estate sector, addressing both the industry's most pertinent challenges and opening doors for new possibilities. The adoption of blockchain is about fundamentally changing how transactions are conducted and how ownership is managed in the real estate market. So for example, in 2017, the Dubai Land Department set a precedent by becoming the world's first government entity to implement blockchain tech on a large scale. The initiative involved creating a comprehensive blockchain for all properties in Dubai, accessible to investors, government entities, and private sector partners. The DLD has made it easier for investors, both local or international, to verify property data with a high degree of accuracy and make informed decisions by having a clear picture of property transactions. Another example in real estate is how the use of smart contracts can be used to mod, mod, automate everything from title transfers to escrow, reducing the chances of disputes as all items are defined and executed by the technology itself. Additionally, tokenization opportunities for investment and growth, according to a report to, by the Boston Consulting Group, the global market for asset tokenization could reach 16 trillion by the year 2030. Marvin, moving right along, and I need to take a little sip of something. So this next article, it's a really interesting article covering a wide variety of technologies, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, how it's becoming vital in analyzing large amounts of real estate data to predict market trends and property values. This allows investors to make informed decisions. It discusses blockchain, the transparency, security, use of smart contracts and tokenization, and how it's making it the process faster, more efficient, and more trustworthy. Big data and analytics is playing a pivotal role in decision-making. Real estate companies have access to massive amounts of data related to property prices, market demand, consumer behavior, and economic trends. The article also discusses other technologies we don't normally talk about here, but I just wanted to highlight really quick. Virtual reality and augmented reality, providing 360 degree views of the home and simulating interior designs through mobile devices in person. The internet of things, creating smart homes, how cloud computing is providing better management of large data sets made accessible from anywhere digital marketing and online platforms, as well as drones for property inspections and marketing. So as these technologies continue to evolve, we will see even more innovative solutions benefiting buyers, sellers, agents, and developers. And embracing these techs is key to staying competitive in the future markets. And then our last article talking about fraud and dealing with it with AI and blockchain, so it really covers real estate fraud on the various forms it can take, such as property title fraud, identity theft, mortgage fraud, and wire fraud. Traditional methods of detecting and preventing fraud are in 
increasingly supplemented by advanced technologies like AI and, and blockchain. AI has the potential to analyze vast amounts of data quickly and accurately, making it a powerful tool for detecting fraudulent activities in real time. AI provides pattern recognition and anomaly detection. It provides predictive analytics, natural language processing, real-time monitoring, and biometric verification. While blockchain provides immutability of property records, smart contracts, tokenization, decentralized identity verification, and transparency. Combining, combining the two enhances data security, it can automate fraud detection response and streamline compliance and auditing. The author, Lola Lang, provides some real world examples and use cases from Proppy. So, Proppy's decentralized blockchain title registry ensures property transactions are secure, transparent, and easily verifiable. ShelterZoom uses blockchain to offer secure and transparent digital contracts for real estate transactions reducing the risk of fraud and enhances transaction efficiency. HomeTrack is an AI-powered real estate analytics firm using machine language algorithms to detect anomalies in valuations and transactions to prevent fraud. And Ubiquity, who we've actually talked about in previous sessions, it's a blockchain-based platform for property record management that offers a secure and immutable method of tracking ownership history. The article concludes by discussing some of the challenges and future outlook relative to data privacy secure concerns, scalability, and speed. And one of our favorite topics that we've had this year, the interoperability of these various platforms. So if you'd like to learn more about these topics or read these articles, take a look at our wiki site, which, hey, that's a great transition over to our next slide, Marvin. So as mentioned earlier, this is the Hyperledger Mortgage Industry Subgroup wiki site. Uh, the link has been provided down in the chat by Alma. So, you know, recommend clicking on the link, saving it as a favorite. All of the articles that we've discussed today are on the right-hand side. And over on the left-hand side, you can find information and previous recordings from all of our sessions over the last several years. In addition, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link on how to set up your free LFID. It's a quick little uh, uh, video that'll run you through the step-by-step -step process. Other than that, those are all the updates we have for this month's special. And back over to you, Marvin. Hey, thanks, James. Uh, as always, that's real interesting information, uh, and especially that article from Lola. I've spoken with her a couple of times, and I thought that that was very relevant, uh, especially if you guys have been tracking the JP Morgan Chase uh, glitch that was going on where uh, people were trying to scam JP Morgan by depositing checks and taking advantage of uh, their ATM systems. So uh, very, very timely. Hey. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Marvin. You know, I don't do the article enough justice because she's got a lot of content in there. And so I'm giving you guys the quick snap snapshot of it. But to Marvin's point, it's a great article to go out and take a look at. Yeah, and I was trying to get Lola to join us. Unfortunately, she had a conflict for this session, but she's definitely open to joining us for a future session. And we may be able to dive further into that. And she may have uh, even more examples for us. So. Uh, thanks again, James. Okay, now I, I'd like to introduce Rick Grant. Rick has spoken uh, at our, several of our sessions before. He's a writer. He's a, a, a renowned speaker, a marketing consultant. He's interviewed thousands of financial services executives, and his company, Content Beacon, delivers high-end content for mortgage lenders, targeting realtors or loan originators, warehouse lenders, targeting correspondents, and title underwriters seeking to launch title agents and more. And he's going to speak about AI and blockchain. So, uh, Rick, go ahead and take it away, and I'll bring your presentation up. Great. Marvin, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm so pleased that you didn't say <clears throat> expert because that makes my wife laugh and laugh. 28 years of marriage, you know what words not to use around your wife, <laughs> and that's one of them. And, and, and I'm not. 
But what I am is someone who loves to talk about technology with people who know about it. Today, instead of giving you a rundown of what's out there, which I think, James, you did a fantastic job of, and you do every week, keeping us up to date, but that changes so fast that what I want to do today is show you how I look at new technologies and, and how I see them in the hopes that it will add some value to you. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First of all, who the heck am I? Why do you even care what I think? I started writing about uh, mortgages and mortgage technology in 1997 for National Mortgage News in New York. I worked there for years, eventually became managing editor of Mortgage Technology Magazine. I went over to Real Estate Tech Insight Newsletter for a while, and today I serve as editorial director for Weekly Real Estate News. So I'm constantly getting to visit with super smart people. And if you do that enough, you start to see trends and you can see a bit of the analysis come out. That's what I want to share with you today. Um, but first, I want to talk about, oh, is this, so I'm seeing, oh, are you still working on getting mine up, Marvin, or is it up there? Uh, it's up. Oh, I just can't see it. Why can't I see yeah, it? Yeah, actually, Marvin, we still see the our presentation. Okay, uh, apologies. So I'm going to stop share and do a reshare. Okay, that's fine. I don't want to get everybody's like, oh, is this going to be really something fantastic? Obviously, no, no, very simple. But there you go. How's that? There we go. Okay, so that's who I am, former journalist. I look at all of this stuff through the eyes of someone who has to tell the story. And if there's any truth about reporters that you should all know, is they live in constant fear of looking stupid. Because if a reporter looks stupid to their readers, they lose credibility, they lose readership, and they're going to be out of a job. They have to identify what's what's real and what's maybe not quite real yet. And how do you do that? I want to tell you how to do that in our next slide. So first of all, technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. Do I do that? Do I move them or do you move them on? Just, yeah. Okay. All right. So when I started reporting, it was, oh. Okay. <laughs> you guys are thinking this guy is an idiot. No, I just want to say I'm going to be talking really quickly because I'm very excited about what Jimmy's going to share and I don't want to get in the way, but I do want to share some ideas with you, right? So when I started writing about technology and financial services, it was all about better, cheaper, faster. You had to have one or more of those or you wouldn't be taken seriously. Well, today, blockchain, AI, machine learning, it's changed all of that. Today, we don't want the same old thing. We want something new and innovative, as long as it doesn't disrupt what we're already doing, right? And that's the challenge that a lot of technologists have to overcome. <clears throat> because everyone out there will tell you, I want the newest, greatest thing. But they won't adopt it if they think it's going to cause any hiccup in their current business. And so the technologist has to work them through how that's going to work. So how do you know? Well, I, I don't know how you know. How do I know? And that's the other thing I should say is unless I'm part of a team that you've assembled to identify or or scope out uh, or vet technology for your specific use case, I can't be of much value to you there. But what I can do is tell you, how do I see it? So next slide is how I see it. So as I'm a reporter and I'm looking, I want to see the value of this technology. And I use two scales for that. First of all, where it is in the life cycle, and second of all, its application. Where are we going to use it, right? So in the life cycle, it's either brand new technology, it's new and it's untried, but it holds promise, or it's emerging technology, it's in use, it's on the cutting edge, or mature tech. This is tools the industry already knows all about, but they've made some kind of uh, update or improvement to. Where is, it being where is it being applied? Is it an incremental advance? Is this just a little bit better than what we had? Is this a true innovation, something really different is going to change the way we think about it? Or, and this has happened many times in my career, is this misplaced technology, something that worked really well in this industry, but when applied to our industry, didn't really work so well, right? So brand new tech is, I don't want to say often, but but likely to be misplaced tech. It's a new application that was brought from somewhere else, doesn't quite fit. Um, mature tech, you're almost always talking about an incremental advance. And while this may be good, it's not really the story I'm looking for. It's probably not the tool you're looking for. 
You want emerging tech, which is more likely to be an innovation, something that's brand new. It maybe has a user or a couple, because that's the first question they always ask, right? Who's using this? It has a user, but it's something new. That's where the magic happens. That's where we've got to find it. All right. So the next slide, and here's the problem with that. So we get into our rooms and we brainstorm all this up and we come up with an idea and a use case. We productize it. And that's our idea we take to market. But what I found is that the, uh, the first idea is almost never the real idea. All right. So I've created something I call an innovation prism where you can shine any idea into this prism. and It's going to split it just like we split light into ideas that are simpler, easier to, to test and ideas that are more complex and more profitable, perhaps, on the other side. So you can see the whole range. Now, we have normalized in our society the idea of the pivot. You're working, it doesn't work, you pivot. I think it's much more likely to be successful if you just shift. Shift in the prism's output, right? If this isn't working, maybe you need to go simpler until you can push them through the buyer's journey. Or if it's really getting accepted, maybe you've got to bump that up and capture more market share and get more of the solution, right? So that innovation tells me when I look at something new, I may not be looking at the real idea. I may just be looking at some piece or part of the real idea. All right, so next slide. When we talk about ideas in uh, blockchain and real estate, and I just want to look at real estate. I've been talking to a lot of agents because of my work at Weekly Real Estate News, and and they've got all these areas where they're looking for new solutions, and they're very excited. Uh, one of the guys I talked to last week is talking about um, lead and marketing management, and he's saying, dude, these AI tools are getting so good. I can create an AI agent, and they can walk them through all the initial stuff, and by the time it gets to me, I know they're pre-qualified. They're a real, they're a real buyer, somebody that's going to buy, but I can spend my time on. We've all heard a bunch of stuff about title and closing. And that we're going to hear a lot more about in the future because of the drivers that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but but all along this, and this is just the view from the broker agent. The thing about the, the prism is the colors change depending on your viewpoint. So if you're talking from an investor viewpoint, or if you're talking from somebody that's an investor in commercial real estate, or if you're talking about somebody that's on the back end, like where you play, Paul, where it's about whole loan sales and trying to track those assets after the house and loan already done, we're dealing with the paper asset now. All of the innovative tools, all of the analysis for any tool has to change, right? We have to look at it in a new way. And this can be super confusing for buyers because they... And then they got to ask, well, how's it going to fit with the other people? And how's it going to work with the other things? Then I'll tell you how I get around that as we go a little bit deeper into this. Now, next slide. So blockchain, you guys, James, you mentioned you have like two years worth of news in here. That's fantastic. This is not new, right? This is not new stuff. This is, this is emerging stuff, right? NAR was writing about this back in 2022 and blogging as early as 2017, at least that early. Mismo's already got their white paper out June of last year. <clears throat> Companies like Consensus are pushing really hard <clears throat> to get blockchain into commercial real estate because they have this platform that people can come in and build their thing on. Um, lots of people are seeing the benefits, but the applications that advanced that have been advanced, and this is my take on this, few applications, none really fully adopted. Um, Jimmy may push back on me for that. James may push back on me for that because I'm not seeing everything. But what I can tell you is that we have so much ground unplowed. There is so much more we're going to see. And I don't want to talk about AI too much because I'm now, I actually have a dog in that fight now and I'm a principal with a company that does that. But we are just seeing the beginning of the applications for these tools, right? All right, so the next slide. So, <clears throat> so you mentioned a bunch... James, here's a bunch more. You mentioned Proppy. All of these are out there. You know, they're all they're all trying things. They're setting up things. Jimmy's going to show us another one, which I'm very excited about today. So, so the the ideas are coming out there. The question we have to decide is, all right, are these going to be the real idea, 
Is it going to be some frequency? Is it going to be some kind of view into the right idea? Or are we going to do something different, right? And the next slide, I'll tell you how I try to see this. What I try to do is just predict the future, right? So if you can see where everything's going, then you can have a better idea of what tools are actually going to make it and what companies are going to stand the test of time so that a reporter can write about these companies and not two days later look like an idiot when they go out of business because they didn't have anything, right? Which is always the fear. Um, a lot of my work now is on the marketing and PR side where I go in and help executives talk about these things so reporters feel comfortable to talk about them too. Because if they're not comfortable, you're not getting ink. That's just what it is. So I already said, first idea is almost never the one the industry chooses to adopt, but some version of that, right? Some, some diffraction of that idea will be adopted by somebody. And that's probably what's going to catch fire. Um, in my mind, innovation is exactly like creativity, right? It's a boundary value problem, right? Great artists will tell you that, uh, there, Orson Welles said it best, I think, there is no art without boundaries, right? If you don't have constraints, you can't make art because art is you're making best use of the constraints <clears throat> you find yourself in. This is why drivers are so important. Investors, big investors in particular, regulators, because they set those boundary lines so that we can innovate within them. And if somebody's innovating outside of those boundaries, uh, that's risky. That's really risky. That's not going to be easy, right? They got to be inside. You got to color inside the lines, but you got to do it in a, in a new, exciting way. Not just better, cheaper, and faster of something we've been using for 20, 40, 30 years, right? But something that says, look, we can see this. We can look at this problem differently if we do this, right? So who's driving that? That's my next slide, probably my last slide, right? You got to go to who's making the rules in place in in the the game board that you're playing on, whatever it is. Somebody's making the rules. Find out who they are. In mortgage, where I've spent a lot of my career, the federal regulators make rules, state regulators make rules, but investors make a lot of rules, right? Because if they don't play, nobody plays, right? So we can see a massive investor, not saying any names, who a decade ago said, we've got to take all this appraisal data and make it electronic and you got to put it through our portals and it's great. And the appraisers get all upset and say, you're going to work us out of a business. And they say, no, that's a, that's a conspiracy theory. Just, just, just give us all your data. And then during COVID, we saw tons of appraisal waivers because the GSE said, well, we have all the data, right? Okay. Now lenders are out there working today. And the big investors are saying the same thing. Well, we are never going to replace the primary mortgage. That's conspiracy. That's stupid. And it may be. It may be me, an old guy, not very wise, but old, saying this could all change, right? It could all change. If the data for a property is in a blockchain, accessible to anybody that wants to get it, immutable, so it's protected and accurate, or accurate to the limits of whoever put it in there, then underwriting is just glancing at it, right? Does it fit? Is it in our credit box? Is it, do we have the, boom, you're done. Lenders can do that, but so can investors, right? So that whole game could be different. We're already seeing it on the title side, right? We're seeing big, important regulators look at the title industry and say, yeah, you guys, I don't know, it could be a junk fee. We're like, uh, excuse me, be, uh, you know, we want to make sure that this property actually has clean chain, chain of title and, and that they're not buying something they can't buy, right? And the government say, well, yeah, you're right, you're right, for now, right? But one day, all that information may be in a blockchain. And AI may be able to very efficiently scan down through that and find out exactly any weaknesses, if any exist, and approve a deal. Right for a flat fee, for a simple fee, no insurance. It's just yeah, we certify this is a good deal. You can make the transaction. Boom, it's done. Will that def No, title is not going to go away. Don't get all nervous just because some old guy like me says it could happen. It could happen doesn't mean it will happen. Right. 
So find out who's driving it, and that will tell you where the box is because they draw the lines. They give you the constraints. Now you have a boundary value problem in there, and you can innovate. If somebody is doing all that and they show you their product, you should listen to them, in my opinion. I always try to listen to those people because even if the idea they share with me isn't the final idea, even if it's an interim solution, it's still worth knowing about because the real solution is probably only going to be a shift or two away from that. I don't know how many of you have a digital camera. I have one because when I used to be a reporter full time, I had to go to the conferences. I had to take pictures of the speakers. And at that time, Sony had an oh, incredible digital camera. And I bought that sucker and I went out there and I looked really good with this big kit taking pictures. Um, and today, uh, my phone <laughs> is better. It's better, right? Those tools were interim solutions. Many of the things that we're seeing today may be interim solutions. In fact, many of the people I've helped over the years have been interim solutions on purpose. They knew they didn't have the final deal, but they knew that some bigger company, some big tech firm needed that functionality wrapped into their offering and they built it to sell it. And they built it, we promoted it, they sold it, and I got fired because big firms already have PR. So well, I don't know. I should think differently about the clients I serve. But bottom line is, you may be looking at an interim solution. Now, that may not be a bad thing if they already know what the, the, what the roadmap is and they know it's going to go to be bought by a bigger company and it's going to be part of that solution and you're going to be early adopter, you're going to be ahead of your competition, it's going to be all good. That may be fine. But if you're evaluating technology, you need to know. You need to know what you're looking at, right? All right. So that was really fast. I could have went slower, but it wouldn't have been as exciting. So, so my last slide is, um, yeah, I do a bunch of stuff, uh, but at my in my core, my heart, I am a reporter, and I love finding and telling good stories. Um, if sometimes I'll tell the story I don't even know how to make money from it. I just tell it because it's it's such a good story and it's going to change all of us right what we all do right and while my first 30 years in the business that was promised a lot it didn't happen very often like let me think i don't know i don't know if mortgage.com when garth graham started that way back and he told me rick this is going to change everything and i said yeah i don't know dude i can't even get my dial up to get to that site i don't know what you're talking about. well yeah, it did. It changed every damn thing. But there's a there's just a just a few of those things over the last 30 years. The next 30 years, there's going to be a bunch of them. There's going to be a bunch of them because we have the tools now. We have experienced people that haven't aged out of the business that know what problems need to be solved and they're they don't have a lot to lose because they're not building their career anymore. They're at the top of their career. They want to try something new. They want to see how it works. And those people are like gold to a technology developer because they'll get out there and they'll put it through its paces and they'll tell you if it doesn't work. So all this is to say, I hope you're not disappointed that I didn't point to a bunch of heavy hitter new real estate tech tools. There are some out there. I can't wait to hear about the one Jimmy's going to tell us about next. But there's going to be more and that market is going to change and shift. And what matters is how you view it. If you realize that all those ideas are going through a prism and it's all pretty lights until something hits and works and gets adopted, you'll be able to be on the winning side of that equation when it happens. But the best way to do that is to keep coming to these meetings, keep listening to James and Marvin talk about what is going on right now, because those incremental changes are what builds up to the massive industry shift that I think is coming within the next decade. Guys, thanks for including me. Thanks for letting me waste, spend some of your time. Hopefully it wasn't wasted. My wife might say it was wasted, but. Well, Rick, I, I know when you and I first spoke about this, I, I was thinking more like, okay, he's going to give us a, a survey of the different technical solutions, but the take that you've uh, given us on how to spot trends and the prism uh, analysis that you use. I think that's even a far better presentation 
than what we were originally talking about. Because it, it plants in my mind, okay, how do I need to think about blockchain? How do I need to think about AI? How can I, as an entrepreneur, be able to take advantage of what's going on in the marketplace and, and how to see it properly? Because everything that you've said, I've spoken with, with James, with other people about how blockchain is being implemented in Point Solutions. There needs to be a full ecosystem. I mean, we, we've all had that conversation and I, I absolutely agree. There's a huge change coming out there, like a big tidal wave. And I just need to know where I need to be on that wave so I'm not crushed. And I think that's what we're all thinking. <laughs> right. Dave Fitzgerald is asking me about uh, Doma, Freddie Fannie, and FHA. So, so, yeah, the short answer is no, Dave. I can't speak to that. I'm not part of that. All I can tell you is that when I watched Veros move in and set up the appraisal technology, the, the whole portal for them, as a reporter, I thought, why – why is the government giving all that to one company? And and I didn't feel good about it. Um, and I and I've Virus has been a client of mine in the past. They're not today, uh, but I respect all those guys over there. Uh, that was great. And the way it turned out was not what I expected, or what I think anybody can expect. When anytime you get Freddie, Fannie, and any agency together working on a solution. I'm going to try not to sound too cynical here, right? The work they're doing is important. I'm glad they're doing it. But the unintended consequences that roll out of almost anything they touch are legion. It's 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 scary to me. And if I was in the business, it, it would be even more scary to me. What? Does that mean that we have to stand by or hide in the closet until it's done? No. Be as informed as you can. Watch what they do. Watch what they say. Believe part of what they say. And try to see where the drivers are. Try to see the why behind what they're pushing for. Right? Fannie and Freddie during the um, appraisal modernization, all that stuff that was going on, they told us it was for efficiency and it was for data accuracy and all that stuff is true. But was it also so they could know at a glance what the value of the real estate was in any geography in the country? Because that's what they can do now. They can tell you what a city is worth. They can just look and tell you. They have all that data. Um, will the same thing happen with, I don't know. I don't know. And and just because, should I say this out loud? Just because I'm a Republican and I don't believe in more government, I believe in less government, I may come across as, hey, keep the government out of our business. And we can't do that. Obviously, we cannot do that. The government has a has a purpose. It has a reason to be here, and we have to respect that. Uh, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't make noise if we see projects coming down the pike that are going to have unintended consequences that are not going to be good for us, our businesses, or consumers we serve. Now, I can't say about this whether it will or whether it won't. But before it's final, much of what they do won't. So... I don't know. Said too much, greatness. I'm sure I'm going to get a call from some law enforcement people. But <laughs> this is an old man. This is an old man carrying on what my family calls me and, and griping about stuff that I don't like. I, I like it when industry groups like this come together and try to figure things out. I like that a lot. I like MISMO. I like MISMO a lot, even though some of the hard work they do doesn't actually get adopted by everyone in the industry which causes some problems down the road and waste some time. It's still one of the best, one of the best examples our industry shows to the rest of the world is MISMO, in my opinion. I don't like it as much when the government steps in and says, you know, we're going to fix something here for the good of everyone. I mean, they're probably telling the truth. They probably are. <laughs> Thanks for the answer. Okay, uh, thanks, Rick. That, that was a, a great discussion. And uh, you always have a standing invitation to come join us. Uh, I love hearing you talk. It, it's always so enlightening and, and so interesting. But uh, let's move on to the next uh, item on our agenda. Go ahead and share my screen again. Uh, next, I would like to introduce, um, I'm loading right now, okay, Jimmy Dorsey. As I said, he's a realtor, broker, and entrepreneur from Oregon. 
He also has an interesting history that I alluded to in gold prospecting. I'll let you guys Google that uh, last point for yourselves. And Jimmy's going to discuss his Migrate mobile app that's built on Hyperledger. I've seen it, and I think this is going to be a real interesting tool. So, Jimmy, take it away. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I am uh, I'm a real estate professional of 25 years. Um, been uh, been started in, in manufactured homes. My family, uh, three generations in in uh, the Portland area, um, selling selling houses and. Um, got my start um, right out of high school, uh, like I said, selling manufactured homes and then got into um, um, selling uh, houses in the Portland market, um, did everything from new construction subdivisions, I've done some commercial office. Um, and uh, during the, the downturn, um, I ended up going off with some friends and, and starting the TV show Gold Rush. So that's what uh, you were alluding to there. Um, I thought it would just be kind of a fun picture. So one of my many startups um, over the years, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I started a software company. So I've kind of just played with tech. I'm not a technologist, really. Um, I mean, I can code a little bit. Um, I, I, I oversee the project um, and I definitely direct things. But as far as I, I'm not a dev, um, you know, I just, I just uh, like I said, direct the, the project. Um, but after after Gold Rush, after being an underground miner for a couple of years, and uh, I got kind of really into um, the the land titling and understanding. Uh, there was actually a really great book called uh, it's by Her Hernando de Soto um, about capitalization of real estate, and I, I, I highly recommend anyone to read that book. Uh, it kind of goes through how the the mining and um, early uh, uh, titling of property um, was so important to to American history and and it really got me to understand um, the the real estate industry and where we're at and some of the things that I was trying to to solve I the first app I, I came out with was called Jimmy Dorsey real estate and uh, just trying to take friction out of the real estate um, process by being able to pay for your broker outside of the transaction, outside of escrow. And, uh, you know, like Rick was saying, some of your first ideas, are not the ones that end up um, you know, taking off, but that uh, we definitely shifted into uh, to Hyperledger and, and to the neighbors, which I'll kind of go through a, a demonstration of it. Um, but, uh, but it's interesting, I've kind of shifted almost back into the earlier idea, which was to to get people to pay outside of escrow because buyers right now, that's the number one uh, thing on all real estate's, uh, real, realtors' minds is how are you going to get the buyers to pay for their, their transaction because they're responsible for the, for the commission now. So uh, can I share my screen and I can kind of go into it? Yeah, absolutely. I will stop sharing and you can share. Okay. And feel free to jump in if any of you guys have a something you guys would like to ask about this. Um, I'm not sure where you guys want me to take it, but uh, oh, I want to share it. I just want to do it. There we go. All right. So, can you guys all see this? Yep. All right. So, Migrate was uh, was born out of the Jimmy Dorsey Real Estate app, which um, basically was a credit card machine for for agents um, so that they could list a house uh, on a monthly subscription and uh, we're on the Apple store and also on, on the, uh, the Google play store. And I think that the cup, first of all, the reason I named it migrate was that we have a lot of house houses here in, in America that are not being utilized. Uh, actually Inman came out with a story just this morning. Uh, I think it was written yesterday and here's the title baby boomers own a quarter of all large homes in the u.s and they aren't selling that was the headline came to my email this morning very timely i think there's two and a half rooms per man woman and child in the united states uh, we are building less in 2023 there was less permits issued for housing than there was in 1973. So we've got a serious problem right now um, with you know creating 
housing for people. Obviously, you know, there's there's homeless issues, but uh, you know, the the reason that, that things are so unaffordable is because the uh, the real estate industry is not taking care of of utilizing some of these properties. So I want to get people to migrate. We got to get people to um, to see the value of of uh, maybe letting go of that five bedroom home and allowing a, a family to move into it. And, um, you know, this is something that people are gonna be trying to solve in the next couple of years. Um, and I think that there's two problems with it. Number one, financial. So that, that's on the mortgage side, we've got to figure out how you can make movable mortgages or how you can get people to, um, you know, to let go of a 3% mortgage uh, for something that's uh, 6%. What, we, what kind of solutions are out there? But the, the second problem is that people aren't really sure about the neighborhood they're moving to. And um, because of fair housing, um, we haven't really de dealt with that at all. Um, blockchain, for me, uh, even though I think that um, abstraction of title is super important for the blockchain industry, the first thing we should solve is um, data. And so I, I like to call it data instead of I identity uh, blockchain, because really a lot of times with identity blockchain, it's not about proving who you are, but it's about obscuring or obfuscating um, some part of disclosure. So you want to let somebody know that you're a neighbor, but maybe you don't want to let them know where you live or, or uh, your name, or, you know, I mean, you guys are all familiar with, with what blockchain can do and identity um, uh, and, and credentials can do. So we, uh, we allow people to connect neighbors to any listing. Buyers can meet neighbors through private chat and uh, we're using Didcom one. So if we're going to get right into Hyperledger here, I don't know how technical do you want me to get? Oh, you can stay relatively high level from a technology perspective. And if people have technical questions or want you to go more in depth, I'm sure someone will chime, chime in. Okay. Well, I'm just going to give you an overview, but uh you know, what, what Migrate is now is buyers can be listed just like a house. So we have a reverse search. And that reverse search happens very simply. It's just like when you're uh, looking for a home, you put in three bedroom, two bath, and, you know, you're looking for a hot tub. Th that can become a, a, a safe search, a favorited search. And when that happens, if you're a buyer on the system, it now becomes public. And you can chat with that buyer. So uh, neighbors of a listed house can also re receive no notifications that a potential buyer would like to connect. Uh, and this is the same with sellers of a listed house can also receive a notification and even sellers who are not listed on the MLS. So this is not a way for, for sale by owner exactly. It is a way for um, an agent to be in the middle of a transaction because uh, our buyers definitely have an agent that they're working with. So all, of, all the users, whether you're a seller, buyer, neighbor, or owner of the Migrate app, they're, they're issued a Hyperledger wallet. And um, then the real estate agents are able to issue a verified credential as to who that person is. Um, it's kind of an overview. Uh, if you guys want to slow down the video later, you can check out how that works. Uh, when a neighbor signs up, Migrate, we send a free directional sign to agents that connect interested buyers to your listing. So this is kind of our directional sign. It has a QR code. Uh, and that basically helps them download the app. And then you'll see which houses are, are migrate home because of the, uh, there's some balloons. Um, and then from there, um, you can click to, uh, to meet the neighbors. Um, back to what I was saying earlier, the NRR settlement uh, mandates all buyers have a contract. And you have to have upfront now, before you even see a house, you have to have an upfront contract on how much you're going to pay that agent and uh, Zilla will tell you that um, the best way to sell a house is to show up um, with no strings attached and show the house to first meet somebody. And so right now with there, there's coming out with all kinds of uh, uh, no hook type of, of contracts, but that puts a, a buyer's agent in a real bind because if they want to buy that house, I think you're still obligated to, to write it up, even if you're not getting paid. So our answer is very simple. You just give them an option to prepay without paying commission. Now, I've been doing this for seven years on the, on the sales sell side, um, charging a monthly fee to sell a house. And what, what we're really talking about is not value of your, of the agent. 
So we're not talking about a value proposition because that's what agents will say all the time. You, you, you know, pro provide your value. Here I provide the risk. So I'm transferring the emotions, the risk, the stress to the seller saying, if you want to pay me, you're going to pay me for my time. I'll get this listing done. We'll put it on the MLS. I'll negotiate it for you. But you're going to uh, pay up front, whether I sell the house or not. And believe it or not, this has not been done much in the real estate industry. Um, I mean, there's you can definitely find somebody for 100 bucks, 300 bucks. There's a guy in Alabama who do it for free. Well, they'll put it, you on the MLS, but it's always add-ons. They're never they're never going to give you the full meal deal, where we're talking about negotiations, contracts, um, you know, the, the the full meal deal, the, a exclusive representation. Um, usually, it's limited, and here I'm getting you know I'm giving you the full representation for a certain amount per month. Um, we get paid immediately for our work. Um, it, it creates a VIP client, especially on the buy side. Um, you pay fourteen ninety a month at least for me. Uh, I have an agent; she's a different uh, price. Every agent can be a different price on the app. Uh, we don't set prices, and um, this also answers lawsuits by getting buyer broker agreements easily signed. Because even if you get a, a buyer broker agreement signed, that doesn't mean that they're going to buy the house from you. And that even if they close with somebody else, doesn't mean you can sue them and get them to uh, to pay. Now on a listing agreement, there's plenty of precedent for the work you've done to market the house. So if you've marketed the house, the, the judge says, yeah, you're entitled to a paycheck. But if you were not the procurement of the sale on the buy side, then judges a lot of times will say, or the mediator, whoever you're working with, will tell you that, hey, you know, you weren't there at the time that they, that they bought the house. You may have had a buyer broker agreement, but it's just not valid. So if we market the buyer just like we did market a, a house, would that provide um, more of a justification for keeping that, that, uh, that money? So this is what our signs look like. Um, you know, there's a couple different companies out there that are doing it. Um, I'll go right into the, the UX because um, I think a lot of you guys who are, are interested in, in, in use cases for Hyperledger I'm just going to kind of show you without having you had to download the app right now. It's only really available to look at houses in the Portland market. Uh, we're, we're with the RMLS of the Portland uh, metro area, which is Vancouver, Portland to the beach, all the way over to Bend. But you won't be able to see it in your neck of the woods. So uh, new customers, they enter their phone number. We use Twilio to just make sure that the, the phone is actually um, registered to the person that is signing up. Um, it's just a simple API call. We're either doing it through your phone number, or your email, and then the new users sign up to accept the wallet. We don't just download the wallet when you download the app. Um, I want you to read the terms of service, understand what you're getting into. Um, it might be a little lengthy. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll uh, as Rick said, we'll shift a little bit on on maybe this process. But um, you have accept the terms of use and then. Basically, the, the Aries mobile wallet is, is downloaded onto the cache of your phone. And uh, we have a back end for, for agents. So when you're an agent and you're, you've given that credential, it, it expands. You can actually manage your records. You actually have an idea, uh, a CRM in the back end. And our CRM looks similar to this. You can go to John Smith and uh, put in the showing broker and then add the credential right there. It's pretty simple. And this issues the uh, the verified credential um, for if you're a neighbor, owner, buyer, or seller, and then we associate a listing to it. So if you're a neighbor of 13803 Northwest 48th, then we do that right here on the app. And now the, the uh, map turns blue. That house now has a neighbor that's associated with it. And we're in the process of trying to make the whole Portland area go blue. Uh, making sure that we have the neighbors um which is that's that's one of our that's one of our uh, issues right now is getting you know it's chicken or the egg how, how do we get the neighbors involved um i think we need to get the neighbors involved by talking with their own neighbors first so you know creating an hoa app and that's what we're we're working on next um, but chat is available for the neighbors to connect. They do have to, it, there is an invitation, as you can see. And then once the invitation is accepted, then you can chat. Again, maybe there's a better way to do it. Um, 
I'll kind of give you some screenshots of what we're doing next is, is really outlining those HOA neighborhoods and getting the, the presidents involved. Um, you know, we're creating some new screens uh, to get listed as a buyer. Um, we're really focusing on, on HOAs right now. Uh, we think that that's really the way we can get adoption. Um, adoption's hard. I think especially the first seven years, any seller would do this subscription that I, I pitched it to. Uh, my, um, my conversion rate was amazing. The buyers, not so much. The buyer said, we don't have to pay for, for, the, for the agent. And I was the first person in the Portland market to go to a zero commission. And I had agents who would call me and say, hey, uh, I got a client who wants to see your house, but you're not paying me. And I said, yeah, that's, that's kind of the new way of doing a business. They said, the, the, the business will never go that way. And, and I was like, it's going to go that way. Um, that doesn't mean they're not going to get paid. I just, you have to figure out how you're going to get paid from your buyer. Or you're going to have to put it into the, uh, into the offer of the house. So hopefully I'm not speaking over anyone's heads. That's what's happening with the lawsuit. And, and it's, I never really actually thought that this would happen industry wide. I thought there would be a subset of us that would do this. Um, but now that's what everyone's doing. So I think that the, the market has solved my problem on the buy side. Um, and, uh, and I really, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on, on getting to know your neighbors. I think that that's the key to getting people to move. Um, it, you know, you can create a compelling reason for people to either try to find diversity or find homogeneity, whatever you're looking for, um, whether it's, you know, pursuits, behaviors, interests, uh, and intent casting to try to figure out where you want to live. I, I think um, with Airbnb, I, I, I own an Airbnb. I own, I own the oldest house in Portland. It's kind of a fun, you can check it out, oldesthouseinportland.com, little plug there. Uh, and a lot of the people who come and visit at our Airbnb are, uh, don't have a house. They're just moving from town to town, um, you know, uh, doing uh, work, just doing, working from remote locations. And I see that, that that's going to actually expand into home ownership. So you guys on the mortgage side could figure that one out, uh, movable mortgages. Uh, and then uh, also, Jimmy, uh, on, yeah, go ahead. Uh, quick question. Um, if I'm a homeowner and I go into your app and I'm listed as a neighbor, but then I sell my house, how is that change in ownership reflected in the app? Do I have to go in and change the address or the new person comes in and changes that address and gets that ID? How is that change recognized? Well, unfortunately, in, in Occupy, um, they they didn't have a revocable credential early on, and that's I was using. Uh, you know, we're using BC Gov's uh, mm -hmm. law network, and um, and so our next iteration of the app is going to have a revocable credential, and that's the way we're going to do it. Okay. So right now, we just go into the database and, and erase it out. So that's yeah. You're hitting on something. I mean, talk about, t you know, the emerging tech, uh, you know, it, a lot of devs said, are you serious about using this? This is so early. I mean, how you're going to run into a lot of problems. And I said, well, it was big deal. We're talking about connecting people. If they have to erase the app, the, the, the entire, all your connections go away. So what? So that's also another way you can do it. Just erase the app and, and all those connections go away. Okay. So I'll just open it up for questions. I don't know if I want to keep rambling on this. Here's some new slides on, on what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I really believe in a, in a reverse search as well for, for buyers. Um, and that's kind of where I'm, all my patents are right now is around okay. this uh, chat and, and the buyers. Uh, another question. Um, you said that this is uh, primarily being used within the Portland area. How would this propagate across uh, the U S I mean, for example, I'm in Southern California. So how would the how would the real estate information or the users in the LA area be included in this? Well, you know we're using the Rezo standard, so which is Real Estate Standards Organization um, for our schema. Um, there's over 450 MLSs in the United States. You have to be a really big co company like Realtor.com or Zillow to be able to afford to incorporate all 450 MLSs. 
Uh, it's a huge barrier to entry, especially for a bootstrapping uh, entrepreneur like me. Um, and, but it's simple. If, if one real estate broker signs up uh, from, the, um, from the LA area and they want to include their MLS, um, you know, we can make that happen. Um, but we just need to see some revenue there. And right. you know, the way our profit model works is um, we just take a small uh, fee for every um, transaction that's happening uh, on, on, the, uh, on the credit card side. We use Stripe and we're just taking, we use Stripe Connect and we take a small um, percentage for, uh, for everyone who signs up as a subscriber. Okay. Great. Well, uh, thanks for walking us through that application, Jimmy. It, it looks really interesting. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour now, so I, I want to give everyone uh, an opportunity to ask uh, one or, or two more questions. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up to see if there are any other questions. I got to hunt for another call, but Jimmy, I like this. I, yeah, I think you're onto something here and uh, it'd be fun to, to get, talk about this with you for the rest of the day, but I have another call I've got to get to. So thank you for this presentation. Guys, thanks for including me too. Thank you, Rick. Have a great one, Rick. Always great having you here. Okay. Uh, with that, we are at the end of our time. Uh, Jimmy, thank you again for walk, walking us through that. You put your contact information in the chat. So if anyone has any questions uh, for Jimmy or would like to discuss this further, please reach out to him directly. This recording will be placed on our wiki as well as the recording from the last call. We were a little slow in getting that up there. So all of that information is out there. Uh, Jimmy just put his telephone number in the chat as well. So in, with that, thank you everyone for joining us for the September call and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.